Good morning and welcome Ecclesia family. My name is Diana and I'm so happy you have decided to join us this morning. We have a special program for all of you with music, a sermon and prayer. But before we get into it, I would like to share with you one of my favorite Bible verses. It's found in Jeremiah 29 11 and it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. This is a reminder that our God has great plans for all of us. He is in control. No matter what you're going through, remember, He has great plans and He has control of your life. And I hope you are blessed by this service. I love you, Lord. Oh, you must. Mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close by no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after here at Ecclesia. I'm so thankful that you are here to join us and worship with us today. You know, 
This month, we are taking some time to understand our vision, confident gospel living. That's what we're about here at Ecclesia. That's what we want to see accomplished in people's lives. And so we think it's really important that we kind of flesh out and understand where the biblical foundation is for this vision and why we want to see that being lived out in people's lives. So last week, if you've been familiar at all, we talked about receiving it. And we looked at a passage in Romans that Paul's talking about how who are we to question the maker who is able to shape the pottery, which is us. And we talked about this imagery of us being like clay or like the ground. And when water descends upon it like rain, it doesn't say you can rain over here but not rain over there. The ground just receives what is being given to it. And so for this week, I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens after you receive. Maybe you have been in that position where you have heard the good news that you understand that Jesus loves you, that He died for you, and that He wants you to live a victorious life. Maybe you've heard those things before and you said, yes, amen, I agree and I accept that, and you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. But afterwards, perhaps the life that you thought you were going to live ended up not being that. Practice ended up not catching up to what you were preached to. And the knowledge of you living a life transformed in Him didn't seem like it actually was playing out. I know for a lot of believers, we're in that place where it feels like we're one foot in, one foot out. We, we understand that God is good and we understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus, yet it doesn't seem like we're living a confident life life. So let's get into it for today. And I just want to let you know that for today's passage, we're going to be in Romans. But I do have to say before we get started, that there is so much to the book of Romans and there's so much to these messages that I'm not going to be able to cover everything I'd like to in this message. So expect in the future of us revisiting some of these concepts and some of these talks so that we can better have a foundation of what we're talking about. I just want to give you a little introduction for today, but don't worry. In the rest of the year, we are definitely going to be getting deep into all of the nuances and really understand a little bit more about confident gospel living. So let's go to Romans chapter 7. And before I get started, I want to tell you a quick story of this coworker that I have. Now, we were talking, and she told me something. She said, look, I understand that God is there, and, and I do want to uh, you know, get to be closer to Him. I want to have a relationship with Him. But I keep finding myself making the same mistakes, making the same patterns in my life, going back to things that I know I shouldn't. And it's frustrating. Why do I do that? Have you ever been in that situation? where you keep finding yourself going back to something, going back to a sin, going back to a pattern, going back to a mistake that you wish you just stopped doing? I know that's the case for a lot of people. And it was the case for myself as well. Well, Romans chapter 7, when Paul is writing to the church in Rome, is describing, I think, an experience that most believers have. And that is, the struggle with sin. So let's read in chapter 7, verse 15, it starts. Paul says this, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want to, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So let's take a pause right there. Almost word for word, that experience of knowing that you're doing something that you don't want to do, yet you keep 
going back to it. You keep repeating those mistakes. And Paul is describing here, first of all, he says, it's sin that dwells within me. And so maybe you're in that place where you've accepted Christ, you're starting out your walk, you're getting closer to Him, but you get discouraged. And the enemy knows this. The enemy would love nothing more than to discourage you and I. When you make a mistake, when you go back to a sin, that's the enemy's perfect opportunity to tell you, see, you're not really changed. See, you don't actually live a good life. See, you really are not accepted by God. If you were, why would you keep making these mistakes? I've heard those thoughts and those voices in my head, and I know a lot of our people, a lot of us, struggle with that on the daily. And so I really wanted to read this here because Paul is saying that it is sin that compels me to do the bad in my life. Then he goes on to say that, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And he says this word before, he talks about the flesh. Now, if you're familiar at all with Paul's writings, Paul writes about two realities. He talks about living in the flesh and living in the spirit. And we're going to get into life in the spirit soon. But basically what that means is when you live in the flesh, this Greek word for flesh is sarkos. And sarkos literally means this idea of sensuality. That when you live in the flesh, you live by the senses that you're aware of. That's the root word for sensuality. So Paul's saying you live in the flesh. What he's saying is you're living a life that's captive to what you can perceive, to your feeling and to your senses. Now let's keep going here in verse 21. It says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. So Paul's saying, look, I want to do what's right. I want to do what God wills in my life. I'm aware of this. And I know that so many of us have that intention and that motivation. That at the, at the end of the day, we're trying our best right, to live a life that is righteous and filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul gets that too. So he goes on to say, verse 23, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So Paul is basically saying that I acknowledge God's law. I acknowledge the goodness. And I acknowledge righteousness with my mind. Yet my flesh is at war and is wanting to go and do sin. Does that ever sound like something that you have gone through? Where you knew what to do, but you ended up doing the opposite of that? Paul knows exactly what that feels like. And he's trying to help the church in Rome. You know, one day I was talking to one of my friends. He is a psychiatrist. He just finished his schooling at Loma Linda and is currently doing residency in that area. And one day I got to ask him a question. I said, you know, what would you describe? Like, how would you describe the human brain? Because I know it's so complex, but from the perspective of a psychiatrist, what, what would you describe it as? And he said, I want you to imagine it like this, Gabe. Your brain is like a hill of snow, and it's covered. And whenever you take an action, whenever you decide to do something, think of it as like you're going up the hill, and you have a sled, and you go down that hill. So then the next time you make a decision, your brain automatically goes up the hill again, And instead of taking a new path, it goes down the descending path it's already made. And he said, our brain is hardwired to go to the path of least resistance. Once we've made a decision, it carves out a region in our brain. And when we come into a situation 
that that decision we could potentially make in that situation, our brain will most likely make that decision again. You and I are hardwired for patterns. The question is, what patterns have we made? What patterns are we making? Paul talks about being a slave. He talks about in chapter 6 that you are either a slave to sin or you're a slave to God. But you can't be a slave to both. And he uses his terminology and I think it's fascinating because our mind is very similar in the sense that we do repetitious decisions. So right now as you're watching what you think and what you act upon, that is making and reinforcing how you will live your life in the future. If you're making good decisions now, you are wiring your brain to continue to make those good decisions. And if you're making poor decisions, you are going to do that as well. You set up your future, whether it be positive or whether it be negative. And I just love that scripture alludes to this and that we're finding out about this in modern science today. So now let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 says this, and I love this chapter. I think it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin He condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5, and I really want you to pay attention to this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And that's where we get into our topic today. Because today's message is called Faith Over Feeling. Faith Over Feeling. What Paul is describing here is that the mind is what leads us to make decisions. But if our mind is captive to the flesh, if we set our mind on things of the flesh, in other words, if you're thinking all day and pouring into your thoughts about what only pleases you, of sinful desires, if that is what's on your mind constantly, guess what you are going to produce? Guess what you're going to chase after? Sinful things. So Paul says that if we want to live life in the Spirit, you and I have to set our mind on the Spirit. When you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has the power to help you then do things that are of the Spirit. It's not very complicated, but I think when we live our everyday life, our experience, our lived experience makes it complicated. We'll say, yeah, I, I, I try to think of God, but then I end up getting frustrated or something else happens and I just, I end up losing focus. That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to get annoyed. He wants you to just lose focus and not think of things of the Spirit to try to be like Him. He wants you to dwell on your shame. He wants you to dwell on the mistakes that you've made on your past. He wants you to think that you're not worthy of His love. He wants you to think that you can't be victorious in Him. He wants you to not be confident in His love. Because He knows that if you're not, you will not produce things of the Spirit. The battle starts in the mind. Maybe there's a reason why when Jesus died on the cross, that mountain, that hill was called Golgotha. And it meant in the skull. In other words, I want to propose that when Jesus died on the cross, He was dying and there was a conflict happening right in the mind. And that when Jesus died for you and I, it was 
to free us with the mind. That when we become slaves to Him, when we let the Spirit renew our mind, and the Scriptures talk about this, when we let it renew our mind, refresh our thoughts, we will produce things of the Spirit. And verse 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then verse 9, and here is the kicker, and this is where we really start to pull it all together. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So the question becomes this. Paul says, if, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, then you are in life and you have the Spirit. So how do you know? How do you know if His Spirit dwells in you? What guarantee do you have? Do you receive? Do you receive His Spirit? If the answer is yes, I want His Spirit in my life and I want to be like Him and I accept Jesus and all the love and things He's done for me so that I can live in Him. If that is what you want, then by faith, you have the Spirit of God. It's as simple as that. That's grace. That's grace. That the Spirit of God says, yes, you do have me. And Paul writes this saying, you however. Because I think Paul knows that people are struggling in this idea of the flesh and spirit. And feeling like you're one in, one out. And kind of going back and forth. And so Paul writes to this church in Rome and says, verse 9, you however are not in the flesh. So he corrects any type of thinking. He says, you however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to Him. But you might be wondering, but that's the thing though. I do want Him and I accept Him and yet I still find myself doing those things. What's wrong? And that is where we get into faith over feeling. Because Often what happens is that when we experience a moment of transformation, when we say, yes, God, and we rise up in our confidence in Him, and when we receive what He has for us for the day, and then something happens, it feels like, oh no, I have to go back. Oh no, I'm, I, I've made a mistake. Oh no, I, I, I guess I'm not where I thought I was. Oh no, I guess I don't have a spirit. Oh no. No, church. This is where we need to have faith rise above our feeling. You see, let's break it down here. The enemy knows that the best way to attack you is through the feeling. If the Bible says that you and I have been captive to feeling, then of course the enemy is going to use feeling. That is his biggest weapon. That is his greatest entanglement. Remember, we talked about this idea that the flesh is sensuality. Well, what is sensuality? It's feeling. And if there is any type of bad arbiter of truth that we have in our society today, it is feeling. If you listen to pop radio, if you listen to so many songs, so many of what our young people are listening today are songs reinforcing feeling that truth is defined by how you feel. If you don't feel this way, then it can't be true. And if you feel this way, then it must be true. And I'm here to tell you, church, that feeling is a 
poor excuse for God's truth. We've substituted His Word. We've substituted love. We've substituted power for feeling. You know, in James chapter 1, he talks about how our life should not be like wind and water going back and forth in the sea. That's what feeling produces. One day you can feel great and the other day you can feel bad. I work in an environment where every single day people change because of their feeling. I work in Alzheimer's and dementia and one day they can feel great and they'll say, hi, how are you doing? And they'll talk to you and the next day because of their feeling, they'll spit at you and they'll curse you out. Feeling is not a good way to live your life. That cannot be the ultimate standard of truth of by which we live. We have to live by something greater than feeling. And this, I think, is the problem that the enemy has tried to ensnare us. That when we make a mistake, we get caught up in the feeling of that mistake. We get caught up in the feeling of shame. And therefore, we identify with being a sinner. We identify with being uh, not worthy. We identify with the feeling of mistakes. And that is just not true, church. Paul says here, you hover not in the flesh. And he talks about the mind. The only way you and I are able to live a life confidently in Him and to say ex and to live exactly what the scriptures are saying is through faith. If you don't accept Jesus, that His love is stronger than any type of mistake that you've made, then you're always going to live life feeling like you're trying to catch up to Him. You're going to feel like you're trying to trying to just get a little bit better for the next day. Church, that's not confidence. That's not confidence. What, what, what Paul is saying is that you and I can be free. You and I can have the Holy Spirit in our life. You and I can be conquerors. You and I, if Christ has died and has risen, you and I can participate in the same reality. But if we do not lend our mind to the Spirit, our mind will go to the flesh. And this is the tension that we live in, church. That our flesh will want to take control. But thanks be to God that through His Spirit, through the mind of Christ, we can say, flesh you have no power over me today. I thank you because I have His thoughts and I am able to conquer you and I am victorious in you. When we speak that, when we pray to God like that, when we thank Him that He is changing our mind, we rebuke the desires of the flesh. There's no room for the flesh to come back in. So, church, if you find yourself, maybe it's tomorrow or maybe in a week, maybe you find yourself and you violate your conscience, you have sinned. I want to share this with you. If you find yourself that you violate conscience or you've sinned, this is the perfect opportunity, church, to instead of dwelling on your sin and your mistake, to tell God, Father, I thank you because your spirit has made me aware of what I did wrong and I am growing in you. So Father, because I am aware, I can rebuke that thing and know that I do not belong to sin. I belong to you. I'm not in and out. I am in because you say I'm in. And I'm not going to let a decision, a pattern that my mind has gone accustomed to to speak the final word because you are actively changing my mind. You are transforming me. And all the wiring that I made, all the decisions, the past decisions that I've made, 
that have led me to these mistakes, you are rewiring me. So thank you for giving me the knowledge because if your spirit wasn't in me, I wouldn't even care about this sin. You see, church, that helps you get your mind focused on the spirit. Don't be deterred. Don't let a mistake or something that you said that you didn't mean to say but it escaped your mouth, don't let that hold you back and feel like you're back enslaved to sin. The Bible and God doesn't want you to live a life in a pattern where you're constantly thinking less of yourself, where you feel like you can't be above and rise in His love. The Bible wants you to be free. And this is part of confident gospel living church. I want to end with this. I, for many of my years, was in that boat. I, I knew about God and I knew He loved me. But when I would make a mistake, when I would sin, when I would violate my conscience, I dwelled so much on the shame and, and kept identifying myself as a sinner and someone who's a slave to sin, but then maybe one day God will help me, that it was just this cycle. And I just could never experience true freedom even though I sang about it and I heard about it. And it wasn't until one day that a friend of mine taught me what it is to actually live life free in the Spirit and live life confident and boldly in Him where you can declare, I am no longer a slave to sin. But it started here in the mind and ask Him every single day, Father, make me more like Him. Paul talks about crucifying yourself. Church, today I want to invite you that if you've been struggling with something, if you violated your conscience this week, I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you because even though there have been times where we have made a mistake or we have violated conscience or we've been ignorant, God, your love is so great and so strong that you tell us that we're enough. And God, your love shows us that our minds are being more and more shaped and tuned to your spirit. So God, I thank you that you have given us the light to see the wrongs that we've done. But God, we thank you because we're no longer slaves to that. And by faith, we declare that you are transforming and have transformed our mind and that we are no longer slave to that sin. By faith, we conquer our feeling and our body and our fleshly desires so that one day we can see you face to face and say, God, I served you with all of my mind, my heart, my soul, and my strength. In your name we pray. Amen. There is so much more to talk about, and I'm excited to get deeper into the Word later on this year. But just know that we here at Ecclesia want to see you rise up and live a life confidently in Him. I can't wait to see you. Stay tuned and stay confident in Him. God bless. You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you've won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all I've tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it You choose someone like to carry your victory, perfection.
passion could never earn it. You gave what we don't deserve it. You take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I'm seated in the heavenly place. I'm defeated with the one who has conquered it. Now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it So let all the striving see This is my victory Now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it Jesus has given. 
Hey everybody, JC from Ecclesia. I just wanted to uh, say uh, happy Sabbath and I hope you guys are doing well. Um, let's start this off with a word of prayer. So wherever you are, if you can, bow your heads. If you're driving, don't do it. Okay, here we go guys. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you that we're here together, even though through Zoom, we're still here together, Lord. I just pray that you be with all of us, everyone around the world, and as we feel like things are starting to come back together, Lord, we still pray for guidance for everything. Uh, guidance for our leaders, our world leaders, and guidance for our church, Lord, and uh, guidance in everything, Lord. Thank you for everything that you've given us. We love you. We can't wait to see you, and uh, we're ready for the Sabbath, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. All right, guys. Have a great day. Uh, hope to see you guys soon. Um, that's it. Ecclesia family, thank you so much for joining us. I would like to invite you to our weekly prayer meeting on Facebook. It's every Sunday at 7 p.m. I hope you were blessed by this service. Have a wonderful week.